This episode is all about chemical reactions. Om nom nom nom. Om nom nom. Om nom nom nom. Om nom nom delicious. Reactions to make things fly, to make things glow, to make things pop, and to make things fly. <laughs> <laughs> that works. Wait, did I mention the flying? I'm, I'm sure I did, but I'm mentioning it again because it's awesome. All on this episode of Science Max, Experiments at Large. Okay, Science Maximites, prepare to hurt all through the cosmos. I am Captain Phil, and today we're going to be building rockets on Science Max. Now, we've, we've built rockets before, like this one, powered by air pressure. And this one, stomp rockets, which were also technically powered by air pressure. Air pressure rocket! But today, Science Maximites, we are going to be building rockets powered by chemistry! Chemical powered rockets! Away! Mm. Okay, I promise it'll be more exciting than that. Because today, Science Maximites, we are going to be looking at chemistry. Chemistry is when two molecules combine to make another molecule. Like magic, ooh. So let's take a look at what will be powering our chemical rocket. This, it's an antacid tablet. When you put an antacid tablet in water, it makes little bubbles of carbon dioxide gas. This happens because of a reaction between two kinds of molecules called acids and bases. Like vinegar and baking soda, but all contained in a small package that won't start working until you put it in water. If we contain the reaction, the carbon dioxide gas builds up and creates pressure. High five for science. All right, so let's look at our chemical powered rocket. What you need is one of these. This is a, this is a film canister. And ask your parents what that actually means because they're not used for holding film anymore. You can get these at craft stores though to hold paint or little things. But really all you need is a plastic container with a good lid that snaps on nice and tight and keeps the air in. And then of course what you need are your antacid tablets and a little bit of water. So pour in some water and then put in your antacid tablet and snap the lid on, flip it over, and wait for the carbon dioxide gas to build up, which will build up pressure, which will... Launch your rocket! Ha ha! So there you go, a chemical powered rocket. Come on, let's max it out. So first, I need an expert to help me. Um, let's, oh, Lisa from Logics Academy, of course. Logics Academy people have helped me launch all the rockets on Science Max. This is gonna be great. Uh, oh, I'm gonna get my helmet first. <laughs> okay, let's put... Let's launch some rockets! Let's go! Whoa, wow, it's really dark in this room. I can't see anything. Bill? L Lisa? Bill? Lisa? Put... Bill? Oh. 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 Where did this come from? Uh, I guess the portal's malfunctioning. Hey, Lisa! Hi! From Logics Academy, great to have you here. Great to be here. Let's put this over there. We are here to max out the chemistry rocket! Ooh, what is that? It's just a small plastic container. But when we put an antacid tablet in there and some water... Ah, we get a chemical reaction. We get a chemical reaction, and so that's what creates the pressure, and then that pops the lid off, and we get a little rocket. Kaboom! But now we're going to max it out. Get a bigger container Ooh, and more. Wait. What? How about if we launch a whole bunch of them? Ooh, so we just get a lot of the small one mm -hmm. and we launch them all at the same time. Exactly. Okay, great. So we just need a whole bunch of these and yeah. a whole bunch of. And a whole bunch of science antacid. Yeah, well, that's okay. I get them both in bulk. Come on, let's <laughs> go put it together. And I'm a base, and we are enemies. <gasps> well, we're not really enemies. Yeah, that's true. It's all about how we react chemically. You see, as an acid, I really want to give protons away. Protons, who needs your protons? Get your protons here. Protons, I got more than I want. I don't need them anymore. And bases, we need protons. We'll do anything to get them. Uh, protons, you can protons away. I'll take some, I'll take some protons. You think that when you get these two together, you'd have some pretty great chemistry. 
But the truth is, when they're together, they often don't react. Whoa. That is, until water gets involved. Once you have water, acids and bases react. Wow. Here, take some protons. All your bases belong to us. <laughs> take some protons. I don't need them. more. I want more. Go. I okay, want have more some of those. protons. Here. Water is a solvent, allowing the chemical reactions to take place. <laughs> Depending on the strength of the acids and bases, that reaction can be mild. Would you like a proton? Oh, no, really. I could. Please, please take it. Oh, well, thank you. That's very generous. Have another. No, perhaps maybe I will. Here's yes, one. Okay, um, maybe just one. But if the acids and bases are strong, the chemical reaction can be really extreme. <laughs> this is what's going on in the antacid tablet and why, without water, nothing happens. Oh, water! Water! Come Ask on! What did you do? One. Lisa and I are maxing out our chemical-powered rocket not by making it bigger, but by making more of them. How many more? 400 caps all glued down, 400 antacid tablets, or part of, yep. all glued down, and they're glued on this fancy-pantsy spinning surface. Hmm. So we rotate this part upside down. We fill each container with a little water and snap it on underneath. This way, the antacid tablet and the water don't mix until we flip it back over. It also allows us time to snap them all on. Okay, ready? Ready. All right, 400 containers. Here we go. Let's do it. Once we flip the board back over, the reaction started taking place, building up carbon dioxide gas and increasing the pressure until... So high fives on that. Yep. That worked spectacularly. That was awesome. So we've done this. Let's now, go bigger. Let's go bigger. bigger. Oh, okay. Definitely. So let's go and we'll clean right. this up afterwards. Yeah, okay. Let's do it. Okay, let it go. Whoa. 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 This is a balloon, and this is an orange. When you put them together, a chemical reaction happens. Ah, uh, how'd you go in there for a minute, didn't I? Hit? No? No? All right. Well, you can actually do a chemical reaction between a balloon and an orange. You see, balloons are made of latex, which is a kind of polymer that's very, very stretchy. And orange peels contain a chemical called limonene. Limonene breaks down latex. <laughs> so, we have three questions. The first is, why does this happen? Well, like I said, it's all chemistry. You see, balloons are made of polymers, chains of molecules held together by chemical bonds. A limonene molecule attacks those bonds. Om nom nom nom, om nom nom, om nom nom nom, om nom nom, delicious. And breaks it, that separates the polymers, and that pops the balloon. But remember, it only works with natural latex. So make sure you're using natural latex balloons. Second question, why do they call it limonene when it's in orange peels? I mean, yes, it's in lime peels and lemon peels, but the chemical itself smells like oranges. They should call it orangenine or, or citrus fruitinide or... Anyway, third question, should we max it out? Of course we should, come on. 200 balloons versus two bottles of limonene. Ready, go.
next attempt to max out our chemical rocket was 400 plastic containers. Oh, yeah. That worked well, but now it's time to make the container larger. Whoa! Giant maxed out chemistry rocket canister. I have a big plastic container with a groovy lid that sits there on airtight, which is great. And I have a giant jar of antacid. How many? It was like 60 antacid tablets or something? At least. This works exactly the same as our smaller containers. We dump the antacid in, seal the lid airtight, then flip it over. And now would be a good time to mention not to try this at home. Uh -huh. Okay. Oh, it's not oh, gonna take long. So that was the canister version. Now we need the pop bottle version, the yes. rocket version. Yes. Okay, let's go make that. Let's do it. Okay. <laughs> this is a light stick. It creates light using a chemical reaction. There's a liquid chemical inside and also a glass container that holds another chemical. When you bend the light stick, you break open the container and the two chemicals mix, creating light. There you go, light sticks, chemical reaction. And yes, of course, we're gonna max it out. This is a whole bunch of the two chemicals in a light stick. Let's max it out. So how does a chemical reaction produce light? Well, a lot of chemical reactions produce energy. You might think of a chemical reaction producing heat. Well, heat is a kind of energy. This chemical reaction also produces energy, just energy in the form of light. It's just a different kind of energy. Whoa, max out light stick! <laughs> and now for a Science Max quiz. Chemical change or not? What's a chemical change? Well, let's demonstrate. Look at this. It's a happy little molecule of iron. And here's another molecule of oxygen. If they were to have a chemical change, they would react and form different molecules. Look, it's a molecule of rust. Rust is a different chemical than either iron or oxygen. It's a chemical change. Now, if these molecules mixed and did not change, then it's not a chemical change, it's a physical change. Sometimes it's hard to tell if it's a chemical change just by looking, but asking what kind of change it is leads to good science. So let's look at some examples. Vinegar and baking soda. Is it a chemical change? Yes. Vinegar and baking soda react to form different chemicals. Sodium acetate, that's the white stuff that's left over, and carbon dioxide, which makes the bubbles. How about a nucleation fountain with diet cola and mints? Haha! -ha. A lot of people think that's a chemical change, but it's not. The mints cause carbonation, the bubbles, to escape faster. But in the end, you still have cola and mints, no new chemicals. And without the carbonation, nothing happens. So it's a physical change. Take a guess at this one, glow stick chemicals. Well, producing light or heat is usually a sign of a chemical change. How about mixing sugar and water to make a sugar pop? That's a physical change. You start with sugar and water, you mix them, and when you have a sugar pop, what chemicals are you left with? Well, sugar and water. So, no chemical change. It can be hard to tell sometimes, but whenever two things mix, think to yourself if it's a chemical change or a physical change. And now you know it's either one or the other. And that's the first step to good science. Thanks for playing our Science Max quiz. Our maxed out rocket worked great. <laughs> <laughs> now to make it look more like a rocket. So we have a mesh bag here to put the antacid in. Right. And we have um, some paper clips attached to it. And what are the paper clips for? Well, Phil, we have a magnet. Ah. And so the magnet sticks to the paper clip. And so that's what we have here. You see the bag is full of the antacid tablets, which we put through the mouth of the bottle and the magnet is holding the paper clips on the other side of the plastic. So we can sort of move it along. So we can start with the bag over here where the water's down there, but now we attach the launcher like so. All this effort is to keep the reaction from happening until the bottle's on the launcher and we're ready to go. And then as we pull the bottle over, we bring the bag up this side 
And there, the water and the antacid have never touched. No reaction. All you need to do now is just, we pull this magnet away and the bag will fall into the water. And then we will have the launcher down here. And we pull the release and the rocket will go. We add some weight to the launcher to help keep it in place. Okay, right, wait, glass in. Safety first. Okay, ready? And then we pull the string with the magnet that drops the bag of antacid tablets in the water and starts the chemical reaction. Because we have a latch holding the bottle down, we can wait until the chemical reaction happens fully. And there's a lot of gas pressure in the rocket before... Three, three two, two, one... one. <laughs> that worked. Yeah, I hit the ceiling. Uh, I think we need to do this outside. Yeah, I think we definitely have to do it outside. All right, totally great. Weird. Anyway, I was saying we should put three or four of Three, two, one, go! <laughs> outside and it worked great. The only thing left was to max it out even more. So, larger chamber? Yep, more antacid. More antacid, more air, more water. Absolutely. Bigger rocket. Okay, so you know what? I know how to splice two bottles together and we can increase the size right. of the chamber. This is sodium acetate. How do you get sodium acetate? Well, when you do a vinegar and baking soda reaction, what you have left, once the reaction is finished, is sodium acetate. It's a crystal, and you can do something fun with it that may seem familiar. You make a super saturated solution of sodium acetate by heating water and dissolving as much as you can, and then when it cools, you can get the crystals to reform. Now, if you did this with sugar, you could make a sugar pop, which we've done before. If you do it with salt, you could make a salt pop which is less appealing. And if you do it with sodium acetate, you can do this. Just like with the sugar pop, all it needs is a seed crystal to get the crystals to reform. But unlike sugar, which takes a few days, sodium acetate recrystallizes right before your eyes. Because we heated the water, it allowed more crystals to dissolve in it. Ooh. But then it cooled down afterward. There's more crystals sitting around in this water than there should be at this temperature they want to turn back into crystals, and all they need is something to start them going. I've colored this one green because, I don't know, science. Maybe it'll look cool. A tiny crystal on the end of the stick is all we need to start the reaction happening. Whoa! Wow! And there you go, sodium acetate. Hmm, that one wasn't done yet. We've gone from small containers, oh yeah, to a large container, <laughs> to a rocket. <laughs> yeah! So what's next? Super maxed out rocket! Woo! 12 two liter bottles all spliced together to give us a very large chamber to build up pressure with. So the chamber is all the same, so it's all one big hollow tube, and now we're gonna fire it off. Let's go! Let's do it. <laughs> awesome rocket! Yeah! Lisa and I follow the same procedure as before. We use a bag of antacid tablets held up inside the rocket with a magnet. And once it's sealed on the launcher, we pull it off, let the antacid mix with the water, let the chemical reaction happen for a while to produce enough gas pressure, and then... We fire it! Okay, here we go! Three, two, one, go! Oh my god! Oh no! Oh no! Oh no! That is the highest wow. I think we've ever shot a rocket on Science Max. That's amazing. Well done. Chemical reaction rocket. Thank you very much for joining us on Science Mass Experiments at Large. We should build another rocket, because that one so. is probably broken. That's done. OK, let's go. Let's do it. All right, so this time, I think what we should need to do is. Ah! Oh, no, it's nothing but garbage cans in there. we got to turn the portal off. Come on, we got to get. 
Today, it's all about opposites. Things that float, and things that, uh, don't. Water, and gravity. Gravity. What goes up doesn't have to come down. Unless it's built, you know, poorly. All on this episode of Science Max, Experiments at Large. Greetings, Science Maximites. My name is Phil. And I am Opposite Phil. Opposite Phil. That's right. Blue lab coat, yellow shirt, evil mustache. I see. Anyway, we're looking at opposing forces today. That's uh, forces that make things go down and forces that make things go up. Right, things with more density and things with less density. Uh, gravity and the opposite, which is anti-gravity. Anti-gravity isn't really a thing. You're... Well, I have to do the opposite. Right. Um, buoyancy. And buoyancy's opposite, which is girlancy. No, girlancy is not the opposite of buoyancy. You know, you're not helping. Right, not helping. Opposite. <laughs> Hello. Uh, goodbye. Today we're going to be making a gravity-powered boat. Ta-da! It's pretty easy to make. You just put water in the top here. Gravity of the water pushes it out the straw and the boat goes forward. And it's super easy to make. You only need four things. A piece of styrofoam, a plastic cup, craft stick, and a straw. And the tools you'll need, a pen, a craft knife, and the help of an adult, and science glue. Which is the same as regular glue, except I only use this glue for science. You take your styrofoam and you cut it into a boat shape. That requires the knife and the help of the adult. Then take your cup and draw the circle that your cup will sit in. And then you wanna put two slashes with your craft knife in there. Again, get the help of an adult if you need it. Uh, and then start carving out the styrofoam with your finger and make a nice little indent just like this for your cup to fit in. See, and then it fits in nice, nice and snug. So then what you wanna do is you want to make a hole in the cup. You can use a pencil. The hole has to be just big enough for the straw to fit in. First, you want to take the straw and dig up in this direction so that it will be a nice angle for the water to come out and then you want to get the straw back up into the cup like that and then glue it so that it is not going to leak any water. And then in the final step, and this is your choice, you don't have to do this, but you can use your craft stick and you can make a rudder or if you want, you can make a whole keel which goes just like that and it is right in the middle of the boat and this helps the boat go straight because sometimes the straw goes off to the side one way or the other. Okay, water powered boat. Actually, it's a water and gravity powered boat. You see what you do is you fill up the cup with water and the gravity of the water in the cup pushes it out the straw and the boat goes forward. And this is what it looks like in the water. You fill up the cup and the gravity pushes the water out that way. The buoyancy of the boat keeps it afloat and good old Newton's third law, for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. The water going out the straw this way pushes the boat that way. And it works pretty well. Whoa, if it's going straight. That's why we have the keel. Okay, so gravity powered boat. Time to max it out. But first I need an expert Bert to help me. <laughs> oh, of course, Michaela from the Ontario Science Center. Perfect. All right. And let's go. No! <laughs> I stopped myself! I didn't get wet! <laughs> and it propels itself along. So, we're gonna max it out and make it super awesome. So what do you wanna do to do that? 
Oh man, well what if we just think about making everything bigger? Okay. I mean, like first we're gonna need a bigger container. Okay, well that's a good idea. Tell you what, I got my waterproof portal uh, ordering device. So I'll order some sort of a, a bin. Yeah. Like a big yeah. plastic bin. Okay, hold on. Hold on. Here it comes. Oh, there it is. <laughs> okay, so a big plastic bin. Yeah. And then, you know, you see this straw here? What if we had something like that? It's a bigger like. Like um, like a pipe of some sort? Yeah, like a big pipe. One pipe coming up. I need to get myself one of those. Yeah, but it doesn't always work, so. Oh, here it is. Wow. So, bin is the cup. Yeah. Pipe is the straw. Yeah. Uh, so now all we need is the boat. Yeah, the platform itself. I think we need something that's going to be really stable because we're going to have a lot of weight this time. How about like a surfboard or um, or one of those stand-up paddle boards? Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, okay, check this out. Uh-oh. Oh, no. Water stopping. That doesn't look good. I think it might have gotten stuck. Oh. We'll have to go get it because the water is still running and that might overflow. Oh, man, so. Buoyancy is the tendency for things to float. Things like this balloon, or this ball in water. But it doesn't float on its own. But it doesn't float on its own. The helium is less dense than the air molecules around it, and they fall past the balloon and push it up. The ball is less dense than the water around it. So the water molecules flow around the ball and push it up. This happens because water is a fluid. The particles flow around each other. This works because air is a fluid. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Phil, air isn't a fluid, but it is. Usually we think of fluid as meaning a liquid, but in this case, fluid means anything where the particles can flow around each other, and that includes air. But you know what? It's hard to see the particles in water. Same thing with air. I can say it, but it's really hard to see it. Now, um, yeah. Now this is sand, and it behaves like a fluid too. Well, sort of, check it out. Look, it's made of a whole bunch of very fine particles, and it takes the shape of its container. But watch this. I put a ball in the sand, and it doesn't float. Now the ball is less dense than the sand, but it doesn't float because the particles of sand have a little bit too much friction right now. But watch as we move them around and reduce the friction by adding some air. Now, the sand is behaving like a fluid, and the ball floats. Let's see what else floats on sand. How about this pumpkin? Yup, that floats. How about this block of wood? Yup, that floats too. How about this styrofoam ball? Yeah, that definitely floats. Look at that. The sand is a fluid right now because all of the little particles of sand are moving around. But watch this, if I turn off the air, everything freezes in place. Nothing floats anymore because the sand is no longer behaving like a fluid. So there you go, buoyancy. It all depends on the density of the thing and the fluid it's surrounded by. Huh? Science. Michaela and I are maxing out our gravity-powered boat. We had a bunch of maxed out materials. We just needed to get our surfboard. So we got our giant bin. We got a giant tube. Water's gonna come out of this end. And we've got a valve here, which means we can fill the bucket, and then we can turn on the valve and see what happens. Oh, whoa! Hey. Okay, you ready? Yeah. Now we're gonna turn on the valve, and that means now the water is flowing through. Ooh. Hey, it's working. It's not bad. Right on. Whoa, look at that. This thing is really working. Yeah, it's taken off now. So, okay, this is good. It's going about walking speed. Now that it's working, how do we max it out? Our fuel here is the water, so yep. what if we just had even more water? And it doesn't last long, does it? Yeah. Maxing out our boat even more is easy. A bigger bin for more water and a wider pipe to move more water for more thrust. Okay, so a bigger bin yeah, it's a lot harder to fill because it's hard to get to the top of it. Well, you're working against gravity, so it's gonna work for us. I can really appreciate the amount of water that we're putting into this. That's 
That's four buckets full. Wow. This is five buckets. We open up the valve and it starts to go. Yep. It's working. It is working. Look at all wow. the awesome <laughs> bubbles. Okay. That works really well. It really, yeah. It's wow. definitely faster than the other one. I think it's the larger pipe. And we need more water because it doesn't last very long. Check it out. It looks like it's going even faster now that we've lost a bit of the water. Less weight. Yeah. This is working great, so now how do we make it even better? Okay, well, the only force working with us right now is gravity, right? Of right. the water coming out. What if we add in an extra force? And we could squish the water down to go out faster. Okay, watery high five. <laughs> okay, we gotta get the, it's all way over here. Come on, we gotta get it. move the water from this container to this container. Now, I could just pour it, but what if it's too heavy? It's too heavy! Help me, science! Well, science to the rescue with this! A clear plastic tube! Ooh, sciency. Okay, watch this. I'm gonna make a siphon, and it's pretty complicated, so follow along. Are you ready? I stick one end in here, and one end in here! Whoa! Yeah, I know, it's not working yet, but that's because we haven't added the science. First, we need to add a little bit of suction and suck the water through the hose like a straw. It has to go over the highest point. Watch this. And there we go. Look, the water is going up. I can even make the water go up even more, and it still works. But why does the water go up? Water doesn't like to go up, right? Well, the reason why is because there's more water going down than there is going up. So that creates suction on this end, and the gravity of this water pulls that water up. So gravity is doing all the work for us. And that is a siphon. Huh? So now let's max it out. This is the same container of water, but now it's colored slightly blue, so you can see it go all the way up through this hose. The only really hard part about this is sucking the water all the way up to there. Okay, here we go. <laughs> I got it working. Now, the reason why it's working is because there's just a bit more water on this side of the tube than there is on this side of the tube. With a siphon, it doesn't matter how far you go up, as long as the water on one side is lower than the other. Science. You know about helium balloons, right? Helium is a harmless gas that is less dense than air, which is why helium floats. If I was to breathe some helium, my voice sounds higher because helium is less dense than normal air, so my vocal cords vibrate faster. Ah! But have you ever wondered, is there a gas that's more dense than air? There is. It's called sulfur hexafluoride, and it's much more dense than air, so if I was to breathe some, my vocal cords would vibrate slower, making my voice lower. Ha 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 ha! This container is full of sulfur hexafluoride. Ooh, I know, it's invisible, you can't see anything, but watch as I blow some bubbles. The bubbles are floating on top of that layer of sulfur hexafluoride. The bubbles float because they're full of regular air, which is less dense than the sulfur hexafluoride. In fact, a balloon will float on this as well. The balloon floats lower because the weight of the latex also drags it down a bit. But the bubbles and the balloons are floating on a sea of sulfur hexafluoride. And it is like a sea because it's a fluid just like water, but it's more dense than regular air. Science! <laughs> it's awesome. Michaela and I are maxing out our gravity powered boat. It was already working well, but now our idea is to try squishing out the water so it gives the boat more thrust. We just had to come up with a brilliant idea how to do that. Garbage bag! Garbage bag! Yeah! Garbage bag! Okay, maybe we should explain <laughs> oh, the garbage no. bag. It's okay, so the garbage bag is attached to the pipe at the back end. There's a hole in the, in the garbage bag. Well, we fill the garbage bag with water. <laughs> then we tie the garbage bag tight. Tie the knot so the air doesn't get it. Now that we've got that, we use bowling balls. And we put the bowling balls on top of the garbage bag, and this will, whoa, squish the water out. 
really is pushing on that bag. Okay, ready? Okay, let's see. Hey, it's moving. Our bowling balls were squishing the water out, but the boat didn't seem to be moving much faster. I think the bowling balls made the whole thing too heavy. What if we raise the bin up? If it's higher up, then there would be more force due to gravity. Yeah, so we have the bin on like stilts or something, oh and then it has to fall further, and then maybe the water's going faster. I love that idea. Okay, good. Yeah, let's try it. So what we need Sorry. to do is get Wait, this. No, no. Oh, I thought this was the shallow pool. No, yeah, no, that's no, that over was, there. That's that yeah, one. yeah, not here. Max Historica. Long, long ago, in the time of ancient Greece, there lived a genius named Archimedes. One day he was in the tub and he noticed something. Oh, hello. Look at that. When I get into the tub, the water level goes up, and when I get out of the tub, the water level goes down. Ha <laughs> ha! Eureka! I, um, don't get it. Well, I can calculate how much volume something takes up by how much water it displaces. Yep, still not with you. Uh... Now, I'll give you an example. How much water would be displaced pushed aside if I put this ball in the water? It's light, so not much. Ah, it doesn't matter how heavy it is. It only matters how much space it takes up. Watch. Ah, you see? The same volume, huh? I think I see. How much water will be displaced when I put this bowling ball in? Uh, more because it's heavier. Ah, nope. It doesn't matter how heavy it is. It only matters how much space it takes up. Watch. Oh. You see? A simple and easy way to measure something's volume. Archimedes, one of the greatest and cleanest scientists in history. Join us next time for more Max Historica. The metric system in 60 seconds. The metric system is a way of measuring things. Water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, a kilometer is 1,000 meters, but few people realize just how interconnected the metric system is. First of all, it breaks down to a base 10 system. Everything is 10, 100, or 1,000 of everything else, and it's all based on water. This is exactly one liter of water. It weighs exactly one kilogram. It fits into a cube 10 centimeters on each side. It boils at 100 degrees Celsius and freezes at zero. And this happy little fellow is one milliliter. It fits into a cube one centimeter on every side. It weighs exactly one gram. And the amount of energy required to raise this one degree Celsius is one calorie. The metric system, everything interconnected and all based on water. Ha <laughs> oh. Uh oh. Michaela and I are experimenting on our maxed out gravity powered boat. Trying to squish the water out with bowling balls added too much weight for it to make much of a difference. So now we've raised our tote higher up, which means the water will have farther to fall and be going faster when it comes out. And I got a totally awesome name for our boat. Tell me, what's up? Totes McBoats. That's a totally awesome name! Totes McBoats! Yes! Okay, so are we ready to fire up Totes McBoats? That's right, yep. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn on the valve. Okay, ready? And let go! Totes McBoats! What we hadn't considered is that much weight that high up would be uh, tippy. Uh, Totes McBoats no longer afloat. We needed a way to solve the tipping problem first. You know what we need to do? What? We need to build an outrigger. All right, so check it out. This time we have an outrigger, which means our boat's gonna be a whole lot more stable. It's not gonna fall that way because this thing is floating. And it's not gonna fall this way because it has a lot of mass as well. I think we're almost ready, eh, Phil? Yeah. Okay, are you ready? Ready. Okay, <laughs> let's do it. Turn on the valve. Go, Toast Me Boats. Oh, yeah. Hey. Yes. Our gravity-powered water boat worked great. The water ran down from high up, giving it more speed due to gravity, but no more mass than before. And our outrigger kept the whole thing from tipping over. Totes McBoats was a success. Thank you very much, Science Max. Experiments at large. 
gravity-powered boat, otherwise known as... Coach Stick Boats! Coach, come back, Coach! Come back! Today on Science Max, it's all about the power of water. I'll see you later. We filter it, pump it, paint with it, and most importantly, use it to crush stuff. Oh, crushing! <laughs> all on this episode of Science Max, Experiments at Large. Ha. Greetings, Science Maximites. My name is Phil, and this is Science Max Experiments at Large, and this is a syringe. You might know syringes from when you get a needle at the doctor, but syringes are used all the time in science because they let you measure very precise amounts of fluid. Now, check it out. You push the plunger down, and it comes out the top. Or you could pull the plunger in, and it would suck more fluid in this way. But check this out. I've got a syringe attached to a hose here, and this hose is filled with water. And I wondered, if the hose was really, really long, how hard would it be to push this plunger down? Of course, I don't know where the end of the hose is because it was really long and I had to string it all the way around, so. Ah, ha, 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 here it is. Okay, so let's find out. Push the syringe down and water will come out the other end of the hose. Pretty cool. You see, this is called hydraulics. Hydraulics is a branch of science that deals with fluids, fluids like water but hydraulics are also a mechanism used in a lot of machines. Check this out. This is a syringe with a short hose on it, much shorter this time, and I press down on the plunger of the syringe and water comes out. And I pull in on the syringe and water goes back in. Because the plunger is airtight, it allows me to push or pull the water. But what if I close the system and take another syringe and attach it to the end of the hose like this? Well, then, if I push this plunger in, this syringe fills up with water. And then I pull this plunger out, the syringe empties. So check it out, this plunger raises and lowers based on what I'm doing with this plunger. And you know what that means? We've made a remote control. Huh? Check it out. So, if you take two syringes, and you take a hose, and you attach them to something you want a remote control, voila, you can build something like this. We have made our very own robotic arm that you can power remotely with hydraulics. Pretty cool, right? If you want to build one of these yourself, here are the materials you need. First, you need two supports and the arm. I used pieces of wood, but you can use wooden spoons, rulers, or pencils. You'll need some craft sticks, elastics, and a paper plate. And of course, two syringes and a hose, which you can get in an art supply store or a hardware store. Here's how you build your own hydraulically powered arm. First, make the base by tracing holes for your supports the width of a craft stick apart. Cut out the holes and use a craft stick and elastic to secure the supports underneath the plate and on top. Then add some elastics and a piece of craft stick in the middle so the supports won't scrunch together. Because we are holding this whole thing together with elastics. Then get your syringe in there and keep it propped up with more elastics. Then get your arm and slot it in between the supports. The arm should be horizontal when the syringe is half full. Elastics to attach the arm and the syringe. Then push down on this end of the plunger and, ha ha, you have a remote control robotic arm. You can also max it out even more by adding more degrees of movement. You can make the arm rotate side to side. You can even add a little claw attachment at the end and power it all using syringes. Ha <laughs> ha, science and hydraulics. So let's max it out. I just, I just need an expert to help me. Uh, let's see. And over in that way. Uh, oh, Chris from Logics Academy, of course. Logics Academy knows all about building robot stuff. I'm sure Chris can totally help me. Let's go. Uh -huh. Oh, hey, Phil. Oh, hey, Chris from Logics Academy. Great to see you. What uh, took you so long? Uh, how long was I gone? And what's with the uh, orange lab coat? Oh, it happened again. It keeps changing the color of my lab coat, but this time, Chris, I prepared for it, and I wore another lab coat! Ha 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 See? Uh, blue? No! Well, you know what? This is happening a lot, Chris. So, so I wore another lab coat <laughs> under this lab coat. I'm gonna have to wear a lot of lab coats, though, because this is happening all the time. We should talk about hydraulics, okay, right? Yes, yeah, because yes. we got some cool stuff planned. Okay, so we're just gonna get the table in here. 
Whoa, oh, okay. This is the cool. hydraulic arm. Check it out. Oh, very cool, very cool. If we want to max it out, what can we do? We can make it bigger, if, we can make it What if we arm. did it so that the force you put on this side gets multiplied so that this side's even stronger? Ooh, what do you call that when that happens? A uh, force multiplier. A force, I like that. Force multiplier, it sounds like a video game. So we would have a lot more power. We have a lot more power, which Ooh. we could do fun stuff. Yeah, so if we had like lots of power, what would we do? We'd like crush something. Yeah, let's, let's crush some stuff. Yeah, we could crush some stuff. Okay, can we start with syringes though? Yep, yep. And then we'll work up as we go. I like it. So what do we need? Do we need different sizes? So yeah, I was thinking we need a small. A delicious plate of cheese and crackers, my favorite snack. But these crackers are pretty salty, so I should probably pour myself a glass of water first, huh? No! My cheese and crackers! Why? Why does this happen? Why does the water stick to the glass? Well, because of science. And the reason why it happens gets a little complicated, but it boils down to this one simple thing. Water likes to stick to things. Huh? huh? Did you see? Did you see how it stuck? No, of course you didn't. You know why? Because it only sticks on a small scale. See those drops of water? That's water sticking to the surface. But it only works when the surface tension of the water is less than the force of gravity, which is why water drops fall when they get bigger. So it sticks to things. That still doesn't explain why you can pour water out of some containers without any drips, and other containers make it nearly impossible. <laughs> It's all about the angle. Water will flow very easily when there isn't a large change in direction, like around the curved top of this glass. But when there's a big change in direction, like at the mouth of this teapot, the water can't make that turn as easily. This is also why pouring from a full glass is much messier than one that's less full. Pouring out of a full glass, the water only needs to change direction this much to flow down the side. But from a half full glass, the water would need to change direction this much. So all this happens because water likes to stick to things. So let's do an experiment and coat this glass with hydrophobic spray. Now, hydrophobic coatings repel water. So if it's repelling the water from the outside of the glass, will we still have the same problem? Well, let's find out. Hydrophobic coated glass, non-hydrophobic coated glass, or just regular glass. Water likes to stick to surfaces, but it can't stick to one coated in hydrophobic coating. That's impressive. Should we try something else? Well, that's one way to solve the dribbling glass problem. Except you can't coat your glasses at home with hydrophobic coating because it's not good to eat. The secret is using a container that has a very sharp angle between where you're pouring the water and the underside of the glass, like this jug. And there you go. Now I can enjoy a nice glass of water with my cheese and crackers. Uh, oh, right, I am. Um, wait, hold on, I can re, I will remake the crackers into, see, look, see, it's just, it's fine. It's fine, I'm not really gonna eat that, I'm just kidding. Chris and I are maxing out our hydraulic crusher. Yes, yes, before we get to that, I have a little game I wanna play. Okay, great. Okay, you can pick either the small one. The big or one. Bigger. Okay. <laughs> so what's the game? Simple thumb war. Uh, I'm gonna press down this side, you press down that side, we'll see you win. Okay, we're getting ready? Yeah. One, two, three, go. Oh, wow, that was really tough. Why was that so hard? Well, Phil, I'm just really strong. Wait a minute, my turn. Okay, one, two, three, go. Yeah, wow. see, pushing down on this one is way easier. You wouldn't it think is. that the small syringe would be easier. Why is that? The reason for it is, is that you have to push this one down a lot farther than you have to push this one down. Okay, see? see? See how oh, far yeah. this one goes and this one's barely This one moving? travels. Much more. This is how we can exchange a little bit of force over a long distance. That's right. To a, a little bit of distance at a lot of force. That's exactly right. Just like the lever, it's a mechanical advantage. Mm -hmm. But in this case, it's hydraulic advantage. That's right. Chris and I push down on small syringes, which gives us more force on our larger syringes. Our crusher was ready to go. Ooh, how about an orange? One, two, three. We squeeze down and... Oh! Oh! <laughs> then we tried a walnut. Are you allergic to nuts? I am not. One, two, three. Oh! Oh! When we tried a golf ball, we reached the limit of what our plastic syringes and our hands could do. We need to come up with a stronger, more awesome crushing machine using hydraulics. That's right, I have some ideas. Okay, good, we can go to, we can use metal. We can use metal. And we can, and use... we can go bigger as well. 
Ew, this water is gross, but I'm gonna drink this water. Why? Well, because of science. No, but I'm not gonna drink the water like this. First, I'm gonna use the power of science to help me clean it. How? By using gravel. Gravel, yes, gravel. So, say I've got some dirty water, and there are particles floating in that water. Large particles, your rocks, your wood, these styrofoam bits will act as the large particles. You pour it into the gravel, and the large particles get filtered out. See, nothing but clean, clean water. Yeah, I know what you're thinking, Phil, that's not really clean yet. That's because we haven't done step two, sand. Sand? Yes, sand. Let's say that these plastic beads are small particles. That filters out the tinier stuff. There, huh? Clean, right? Uh, no, it's not very clean. So we filter the water in the next step with charcoal. What? Charcoal? Yes, charcoal. Charcoal works just like gravel and sand, except on a microscopic scale. Say these bits are tiny particles you can't even see. The charcoal catches these like the sand and gravel caught the larger particles. This is called a gravel, sand, and charcoal filter. The gravel catches the big particles, the sand the smaller ones, and the charcoal the microscopic ones. These kinds of filters are used all over the world to clean drinking water. Ah. Delicious. Science. Max Historica. Archimedes! What? Who said that? Uh, it's me, the narrator. We're doing a segment. Oh, well, I was working. Don't sneak up on a guy like that. Uh, <clears throat> this is Archimedes, an ancient inventor and one of the greatest scientific minds ever. Oh. <laughs> one of his famous inventions was the Archimedes screw. Oh, um, um, mm. ah. <laughs> Which was used to make holes in wood. No, that, that's not what it's for. It's, it's for water. Uh, right. Used to make holes in water. What, what, what? No! Look, did you even do your homework? I, um... Hold on. It's, uh... Yeah. It's, here, it's here somewhere. Uh, um, look, I'll just show you. You see, in ancient times, we had many uses for something that could lift water up from a well or to take lake water uh, from uh, the lake and put it into a farmer's field, and that sort of thing. Ah, okay, I've got it from here. So, Archimedes invented a screw and he drilled a hole in the side of that container. No, no, no. Uh, look, just just sit down. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll explain it, okay? I am sitting, I'm in a voiceover booth. Good for you, now be quiet, now look. What you do is you put the screw in the water like this, and then you want to raise the water higher, you see? And so turn it around like so, and the water fills each gap in the screw, and it starts to come up. It gets to the top, and look at this. Look, we've got water coming at the top there. The water is being pumped up. It is the first water pump. I see. Still seems like a lot of work to fill a glass, but it's very cute. No, we made them bigger. We obviously were not going to make them this big. This is not very useful. Uh, right, uh, Archimedes, one of the greatest scientific minds ever. <laughs> Chris and I are maxing out a hydraulic crushing machine. We tried one out of plastic, but now it's time to make one out of metal. These are called hydraulic cylinders, and they work the same as our syringes. Small ones on this side with a lot of travel, and then a larger one on this side to multiply the force. And some mechanical advantage with a lever to help us push even harder. We tried crushing a watermelon, and it worked great. So what else do we want to crush? We crushed a coconut. It's cracking. Oh, there we go. Oh, oh it's gonna leak. And then a can of pop. Whoa! Science Max Cola, now in the new smaller can. Let's really challenge this press. Ha ha, perfect. Ha, ha. A piece of wood. We tried to crush the wood, but we weren't able to get it to budge. So it's time to max it out even more. I think we're gonna need like a multi-story industrial sized hydraulic press. You know where we can get one of those? I do. Awesome. This is water. Things float on water, like 
pool noodles and wood and toy boats. And now we're gonna do an experiment with how paint floats on water. How's this supposed to work again? Oh! I'm supposed to take the paint out of the can first. This is a fun experiment you can do at home. All you need is a container, some water, and paint. But not just any paint, special paint you use for hydro dipping. That's hydro, meaning water, and dipping, meaning dipping. Carefully pour the paint on the water and add a few different colors. Then take a stick to swirl it up into a pattern. Then you get something you want to paint, and you carefully put it in like so, but don't pull it out as soon as you get it in. You have to spread the paint away because it'll stick when you bring it back out. And then when you pull it out, whoa, hydro dip. Let that dry and then you have a very cool painted toy. Let's do some other stuff. This is a bike helmet. If you put tape on what you're painting, you can remove it later to make parts that aren't painted. Skateboard! Whoa! <laughs> oh, that's pretty cool. Now to max it out. Hydro dip pants! Wearing the pants when you do this is super messy and not something you should try at home. But the results weren't bad. <laughs> Science pants! Science pants! Science pants. One of the ways you can experience the power of water is watching it wash away dirt. You can experiment with this yourself by making your own erosion table. To make your own, fill a plastic tub with sand and tilt it up. Cut a hole in the tub at the low end and put a hose with a trickle of water at the high end. Then to complete your model, fill it with a little happy town. This small model shows how rivers cut their course to the ocean by following the lowest point. Try to design your town and the layout of the ground so the river goes around the buildings. I'll see you later. I'm gonna take a swim in the river now. There are lots of ways to experiment. Change the amount of water or the steepness of the angle. Look at the soil, it's all getting eroded over here. Or the way the town is laid out. Every time you do it, the river goes in a different direction. And have fun. Oh, phew, I'm, I'm tired, I'm just gonna lie down. And that is the power of water. Chris and I are maxing out a hydraulic crushing machine. What about this? Is this what we're gonna use? We went to the Natural Resource Canada's CanMet Materials Laboratory, which is a federal research lab. Oh, this is good. Oh, look at that! Oh, could, is this what we're using? Uh, no, oh, oh I actually, can use this. Hold on, let me figure this out. Maybe, maybe later. What, really? Yeah, it's, it's just over here. CMAT is the largest research center in Canada dedicated to metals and materials research. This is it. This oh, is yeah, it. All right! Hydraulic press. How much force does this apply? This can do two million pounds. That's over 900,000 kilograms. Which is about 20 cars. <laughs> Let's crush some stuff! Let's get stuff. Oh, crushing! We gotta get the stuff. We gotta get the stuff. Okay. We started out with the piece of wood which defeated our last press. And go! Oh, wow. Oh. <laughs> I love that sound. It turned our wood into a pancake. Whoa, totally flattened. So it was time to try some other stuff. We crushed a ball of plasticine. <laughs> oh, oh, that's so cool. <laughs> that is neat. You sort of made a rainbow. Yeah. Aluminum foil. Aluminum foil. Yes, it is now a solid plate of aluminum. <laughs> and a basketball. Basketball. Good thing we got these earplugs in because when it pops, it'll be loud. What? Never mind. Oh, no! <laughs> <laughs> this hydraulic press was so maxed out, we had to think of the toughest stuff to crush. We crushed hockey pucks, a safe, a hydraulic jack with the hydraulic press. Whoa. This is a metal vice. Hard, strong. Yeah, steel. Heavy steel. Whoa, look at it bend. Whoa. Wow. 
time to crush a bowling ball. <laughs> It totally exploded! <laughs> Science Max! Experiments at large! Hydraulics! Whoa! Nicely done! So fun. I should reverse it and we should start cleaning all that stuff up, yeah, huh? I think so. Okay, reverse! <laughs>